My name is Pamela Nomvete, and I'm going to be chairing this panel discussion this evening. Um, I just wanted to say, actually, because uh, in South Bank, I heard the reading of uh, the Robben Island Bible, and it had such a strong impact for me. And um, it's amazing that hearing it the second time, and this time just extracts, it was still as poignant as it was then. So thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce the panel to you this evening. Um, to my very far right is Dame Janet Suzman. Maybe it's me. Uh, most of the people in this room will know her as an international well-respected actress, and you may also know her works as a prolific director. She's worked extensively in the UK and South Africa, and among her many achievements, Dame Janet has an honorary <coughs> fellow of the Shakespeare Institute and was awarded the Pragnell Award for Lifetime Services to Shakespeare in 2012. Um, in the middle here, we have John Carlin, who is a journalist and author. He deals with sports, politics, and film. <laughs> the, his book, Playing the Enemy, Nelson Mandela and the Game That Made a Nation, is the basis for the 2009 Clint Eastwood film, Invictus. To my right here is um, the playwright, Matthew Hahn, of the Robben Island Bible. He works as a theatre director, drama lecturer, and workshop leader in the UK and in Africa. He has a degree in political science and journalism from the Indiana University in the United States. He is also the artistic director of the Common Air Theatre Company, where he directed Subverse, a new writing program to develop political playwrights. A very, very warm welcome to you all this evening. Um, with this discussion, I think what we're going to basically touch on, theme, if you like, is um, what is the relevance of Shakespeare in South Africa today? What are the lessons from the Robben Island Bible and why do they resonate so strongly? I'd like to start with you, um, uh, Dame Janet, because looking at Shakespeare and how it obviously seems to have resonated with South African, the South African people and the struggle, um, would you share with us your experiences of your production of Othello um, against the backdrop of apartheid, and also the approach that you took with your production of Hamlet, and why you took that approach, and, and what, uh, what the response was to it. You must just call me Janet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I always think of a quote that goes thus, Shakespeare's plays, like iron filings to a magnet, seem to attract any crisis that is in the air. Huh. And um, I have always been a Shakespearean from the moment I left Witz a long time ago, um, been and then plunged into the sort of state of the nation beginning of the Royal Shakespeare Company under Peter Hall's aegis. That was the advent, if you like, of the Cambridge School into, Shakespeare, into acting Shakespeare, which was infinitely more minded to see the meaning of the play rather than the music, if I put it roughly that way. My induction <laughs> into Shakespeare has always been a very political one. Um, and so time passed, and I remember the day that Athol Fugard wrote uh, to Peter Hall and to Peter Brook and to uh, everybody really and said we have got to do something. We need a cultural boycott. And that was in the mid-60s. And I remember the letters to the Times, probably a lot of you do as well. <coughs> and then a sort of tumult happened as one realized that cultural boycotts are double-edged swords. We all really know that. And that actually what was happening was that we were playing right into the regime's hands. We were leaving a still pool. There were no ripples, no troublemakers, because nothing was going there. Uh, given that complex story about uh, boycotting cultural things, ideas, in fact, or writing, um, we now come to what was then an equity boycott, the Actors' Union Equity. Um, of course, joined the whole gallimaufry of um, preventing performers from going to South Africa. Enter somebody who was troubled always with my dual loyalties to Shakespeare and Stratford, say, 
and to my colleagues, friends, and what was <coughs> happening in South Africa. I had already become a sort of founding member of the Market Theatre in 1976. That was the place, if you remember, Pam, where it was possible uh, for us to cock a snook at, um, at the regime, at, at South Africa and its mm. absurdities, uh, without being instantly arrested. Um, mainly because it was a club situation and because uh, the Calvinist mind doesn't altogether take, uh, it, understand very easily the matter of sat satire, mm. let's put it that way. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> uh, and so now comes a day when I return, as I very frequently did, back home to South Africa, um, and I see John Carney, my a colleague, I had known John from the late 60s, mm. and we had, we had a sort of fairly combative relationship. I remember him shouting at me at a party at Athel Fugard's, saying, I speak your language, but you don't speak mine, and me shouting back at him, then you're the winner. Mm. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, we had a, a pretty creative kind of relationship, and I saw him in a play at the Market Theatre. I mustn't take up too much of your time. Um, and I thought you deserve something better than this. And it wasn't a very good play. And I <laughs> nestled into my head the word Othello and I thought, of course, he's got to play Othello. And I rushed back home where I found a terrible old uh, copy of my mother's, you know, where the S's, the F's and S's are the terrible, you know, the sort of uh, folio version of uh, Othello. And anyway, I got through it that night and I realized it was the perfect play because that is the story of a black man humiliated by a white thug. That's it. That's the story of Othello. <laughs> it's so simple. It was, so the metaphor for a part just leapt at me, hit me between the eyes. I went to John the next day and I said, we have got to do this. There's a boycott going on. I'm not really allowed to do this, but I am because I'm a South African, really. Um, and then happened a series of things where we convinced Wally Sorotti, who was head of the culture desk of the exiled ANC, that Shakespeare was in fact a protest playwright. Yeah, interesting. Which was terrific. Yeah. And that way John allowed himself to be involved in the whole creation of this Othello thing. What was really remarkable in the theater was that a sort of general mean of about 15% black audience mm. over the six weeks that we played that play rose steadily, a graph like this, um, to about 60 or 65% black audience. Wow. Some word had got out, word of mouth was, that the black tragedy was being expressed in the best poetry ever written. Mm -hmm. It was something to do with that. It was something to do with the expressiveness and the Ooh. dignity and the size of the play. And I used to bump into youngsters, Soweto youngsters, hanging around on a Monday where they did something called twofers, two for ones, so you could get cheap seats on a Monday night. Hanging around and you would say, how did you hear about this? And they would be very monosyllabic, but just, I heard. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and they would come and maybe none of them had ever seen a Shakespeare play before. But that didn't matter, it was singing to them. And I think they saw their story being told in the biggest possible yeah. pictures and terms that they'd ever thought of. And that must have something to do with it, with really never ever um, playing down or patronizing an audience. And the story held water to, mm. for them all somehow. It became like a <coughs> football match. You actually couldn't get in. So we knew it hit, hit you know, funny yeah, bone, yeah. really, <coughs> with that particular story. Yeah. Then jumping to Hamlet, mm. we're now post-liberation. Right. Um, Interesting. Yeah, and this is 2006, and not at the market anymore. Things have moved down from the market to the Baxter Theatre in Cape Town, oddly. Mm. And I think maybe something like this happens, that when the enemy is gone, your target is gone, your aim is not so sure anymore. Mm. Who do you target now? Mm -hmm. So for the playwrights, that is a, you know, grass, it's got to grow slowly and organically. But what do we write about now? 
what's our subject matter? Now the enemy is gone. Mm -hmm. And so um, the matter of Hamlet really became, it's a play which is indefinable. I couldn't define it as I did Othello in any kind of way. But it seemed to me, I'm putting this crudely, that the most imaginative interior being ever created in fiction oh. is put under house arrest <laughs> by Claudius. I think you might remember that act one, scene three, I think it is, where he says he wants to go back to Wittenberg and Claudius says, no, you stay right here. So um, I had, it was a maybe crude symbolism, but it began to work for us all. It was a very <coughs> mixed, wonderfully mixed cast. <laughs> Excitingly so. It was now so nice to be able to mix things like that, wasn't yeah. it? Um, I had him in prison garb, which was, you know, to humiliate prisoners, they made them wear shorts, mm -hmm. not long pants. Khaki shorts, khaki yeah. shirt. Mm -hmm. And I had him camping out in Elsinore's main hall on a Robben Island prison blanket with a mm -hmm. tin mug and a tin plate. So that whenever Claudius crossed the stage, he bumped against his prisoner. Um, <laughs> Anyway, that, that to put it my I don't want to go on anymore, yeah, but okay. Hamlet is a, is a play about the freedom of spirit, if you like, what, whatever it is. <laughs> and I, how I, was I, that received? That was, um, that had a vexed time, because we now come bumping against real life. My Rosencrantz was murdered oh. on a Saturday evening. Um, oh this perhaps is, oh. uh, Gosh. yeah. It's the worst thing that's ever happened to me. It was Easter weekend, and that we were about to fly to bring that production to Stratford-on-Avon mm -hmm. to open what was called the Complete Works Festival. Mm -hmm. And they had invited lots of foreign productions, and ours was going to open at the Swan. And um, I let them all go. They'd done a wonderful performance on Saturday afternoon, and they had Saturday night, Sunday night, and we were to gather again for Monday. And um, I, that boy was um, abducted on Saturday night, oh. and he was shot, um, execution style, on a traffic island somewhere near Cape Town Harbour. His body was found on Monday. Yes. So oh, here we have another reality well, entering exactly, this, the yes. scene. <clears throat> Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for that. Um, we may just come back to you. Um, Matthew, um, I was just thinking last time when we spoke at South Bank and you said that what you really wanted was for the voices of these men to be heard. Mm. You know, you wanted to give that platform. Um, what is it actually now with, with your extensive experience with this play? It's been a long time for you, hasn't it? You've mm. had this relationship and quite interestingly enough, not being a South African. That's right. <laughs> how has your relationship with it developed? And what is it that you actually would like an audience to walk away with? This evening was very interesting because when I, I John gave a brief introduction of, of Sonny and then the play happened and you heard the story about the play and now you're going to go and see the Bible. That's an incredible connection for me. I mean, it, it, I, I was halfway through the play before I realized that this audience would be the first audience that will have heard Sonny's story, I'm pointing to, not, to, her, to her, have heard Sonny's story in his own words, more or less, and now you're going to go and see his book. And that to me is, I can't wait to go home and call him and tell him this you know, profound idea that, I, that, that fell into my head. Just, just, this, just this lovely idea that, that he can tell his story all over the world and, and this book can be there, so you can see the tangible evidence of it, um, and and it does mean something very deeply to him because of the Shakespeare, um, because he, he loves Shakespeare, he, and he and when he was here in July, um, he was always on message. What what does this mean to you? I want young people to read. I want young people to be to embrace literature. I want the young people to put their phones down. I want them to get away from their computers, and so he's always on message. And that to me is just. Um, reinforced to me the interest that I have in developing kind of workshops around leadership, workshops around literacy, workshops around social change, and, um, and these sorts of things based on the Shakespeare, which has been happening quite a lot. You know, there's quite a lot of um, 
courses or workshops around using Shakespeare in leadership and in social change in this. And, and I think tying that into the men's stories is a, is a wonderful next stage uh -huh. for, for, for what I would like to do. And as I said, in the South Bank, it's a little bit easier. My ego wants me to go to the, the National Theater, which was next door. But I think, I think my heart wants it to go to South Africa for sure, uh -huh. but also to work with the young people because, because the young people don't know the names of, of anybody, of all of, of, of 31 of the 32 men or 30, you know, who signed it. Uh, they know Mandela. <laughs> And, and, and he is the lightning rod, even though he always says, it's not just me, uh, it's thousands of men and women. And as, as Sonny says in, the, in, the, in, the, in his interview, you know, it wasn't even the men on Robben Island, because those were, the, the, especially in the leadership section, the cream of the crop, you know, and these sorts of things. So I think there, there's where that, if that kind of meanders, answers the question, but I think there's an opportunity for young people to, to learn about their recent past. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's all about South Africa today and the residents of Shakespeare. Um, John, in your um, article in the Financial Times magazine, I found it really interesting because um, you talked of this residence of Shakespeare and the freedom fighters mm -hmm. and also the debates that came up because of, and you particularly picked out Julius Caesar. Um, and also you sort of speak about the possibility that this was probably influence the leaders into deciding how they would go forward into the new democracy of South Africa. I wondered if you could share your mm. thoughts around this. Well, one thing about Julius Caesar is that, as Dora Thornton, the curator of the Shakespeare exhib exhibition, told me, and I'm sure you know very well, Matthew, um, the part of the Robin Island Bible, in other words, the, the collected works of Shakespeare that is most manifestly, has been most manifestly thumbed through and worn thin, mm. is Julius Caesar which is the sort of political play par excellence in the Shakespeare canon, and in which the eternal political issues are debated, such as you know, ambition versus loyalty, expediency versus idealism. These, these debates are contained there and obviously generated uh, much fodder for discussion mm. among people who had an awful lot of time on their hands to, <laughs> yeah. to have discussions. And uh, there's, a sort of, there's a deeper question in Julius Caesar, which is, um, which is debated in the figure first of Brutus, and the play really should be called Brutus rather than Julius oh, Caesar, by the way. Yeah. Julius Caesar gets you know, removed from the picture pretty yeah. early on. And secondly, uh, debated by Mark Antony. And the question in each case is whether to opt for peaceful resistance or peace, a peaceful response or violent, a violent response. And the peace versus violence debate was ongoing for decades. Um, within the NC, should we go one way, should we go the other? Mm. Mandela himself actually went both ways. He, after all, founded in Quanta West Eastway, the armed wing of the ANC. Um, and it is, I find particularly interesting, there's a moment um, when Mark Antony has a choice after Caesar is killed, and it's the great moment of suspense in the play. Is he going to go along with Brutus? Is he going to go along with the new post-Caesar's assassination status quo? Mm. Um, or is he going to rebel, uh, respond to the call of his heart? And he responds to the call, call of his, his heart, heart, and he says, cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war. Yeah. And Nelson Mandela found himself in that precise situation mm. in 1993. I was talking generally about how over decades the question of violent resistance versus peaceful resistance was a debate, and that is contained in Julius Caesar, and it provoked great food for thought. But there was a very precise moment in April 1993, which was the moment of greatest crisis in the entire transition to democracy in South Africa. I was living in South Africa at the time, I remember it terribly vividly, and it's when Chris Harney was assassinated. Chris Harney is now maybe not necessarily someone that people here are very familiar with. Chris Harney, had he lived, I have no doubt, would have been Mandela's successor. Mm, and definitely. I also have little doubt South Africa would have had a happier outcome had Chris Harney lived. But that's another question we can debate mm. some other time. <laughs> but the point is, Chris Harney was, after Mandela, the most popular figure in the African National Congress. Mm. He was idolized by the youth. I'm sure you would have idolized yeah. him too in your day, Pamela. And he was seen as the heir apparent. He, wasn't, he, was, he was charismatic, um, not in that sort of star quality way that Mandela was, not in the radiant smile, but in a, in a way that inspired profound respect. And uh, I thought he was a fabulous man. He was the leader of the armed wing of the ANC. So therefore, he was a person who was taking life or death decisions. And anyway, he was assassinated, and Mandela 
had a choice. Either we go for what his heart prompted him to do, because Honey was, it's a sort of a cliche to say it, it sets off, but it's true, it, he was like a son to him. He could have responded to the biddings of his heart and gone for the cry havoc, let's slip the dogs of war option. But I'm not going to say there's a direct cause and effect connection, but he saw what happened in Julius Caesar. It led to a civil war, it led to chaos. And, and if there's one thing that Mandela had very, very clear is he wanted to find a peaceful solution and avoid the spectre of civil war that was always hanging over South Africa in those days. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that when it came to the ultimate test, Mandela decided to go for peace. And on the night of Haini's assassination, when the country really was boiling, I mean, I've never felt so scared or indeed so anxious going into townships, which I did every single day for the six years I used to live there, oh. as I did in that period. And Mandela went on national TV and made an appeal to the nation for calm. When, every, when you know, the country really was staring at the abyss. And he went on TV and he made the point that the, the guys who'd killed Hani had been arrested, thanks to an Africana woman who spotted the number plate oh. and had given it to the police. And he made that very explicit connection, giving perhaps that Africana woman a greater measure of heroism than perhaps she deserved, yeah. but in order but still, to send a message yeah. um, to his people. Yeah. Anyway, like I say, Hani is another whole story. We can talk about that some other time. But Hani, when he was head of the armed wing, was absolutely fascinated by Hamlet. Mm -hmm. And Hamlet was a person who's continually having this debate between is he going to fulfill this role that destiny has imposed upon him to be the avenger mm. or will he not? And Hani was ostensibly the, the military leader, the person who inspired fear and hatred among white people, who was idolized as a great soldier by black South Africans. Mm -hmm. And yet he internally toiled and suffered terribly with that Hamlet debate the, between the, sort of the, the contemplative philosopher character and the avenging angel. But I'll stop right there. <laughs> no, we'd like to, it'd be great to go on and on, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? I could go on. <laughs> Um, yeah, we are running out of time, but I just wanted to um, say that, because in, Robin, in the Robin Island Bible, when you talk about Hamlet, it, it was the youth, it was the younger ones, so it's quite okay. interesting what you were saying with um, um, Chris Harney and Hamlet, because it was the youth that That's were right. really fired up by Hamlet. Right. <coughs> I mean, I, when I uh, spoke, when I interviewed uh, Saths Cooper, he said, he said not only was it just that internal debate of Hamlet and all that, but also, to a certain extent, it was the flower power era as well, the, you know, and the hair and all of this sort of the, the musical coming out. So they, they were quite attracted to Hamlet and, the, and, the, and, 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 and all of that. Yeah. Um, but also it was that internal struggle that he faced as a member of black consciousness along with Trini Moodley. And I mean, for the, um, John, I was just going to ask for the, the lessons learned um, from the Robin Island Bible. Do you have a, something to say about that? Well, the lessons learned were the lessons such as the ones I was just talking about right now back in that heroic age that we're yeah. referring to. I wouldn't say, say that South Africa is now in a, yeah. in a heroic age right now, and I'd say right. that, that rather than Shakespeare, the book that I would consider most relevant to describe the present political situation in South Africa is George Orwell's Animal Farm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll leave it to you to ponder that. <laughs> <laughs> and just the last word. One last word um, from Janet. I mean, we've talked about the resonance of Shakespeare. Um, and you said earlier, which was quite interesting, that um, at that time when you did Othello, at least there was a target. You know, people were clear about why they were doing what they were doing. And you said that now it's not so clear. So is there a place uh, and a resonance for Shakespeare in South Africa today? Yes, I think there always will be. He seems to be a kind of fountainhead person. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, people go back and back and back to him for muscularity, for imagination, for daring. He's He's the kind of great surrealist of all time, really. Indeed. He's the furry cup of the ages, the furry teacup. <laughs> uh, you know, he juxtaposes ideas all the time which excite people's minds. Mm. And so I don't think there will ever be a lack of... There have been marvellous Shakespeare productions. I remember the famous Uma Bata, which came yes. in the mid-60s. Yes. Do you remember that? Which yes, I do. set London by storm. Um, uh, a Zulu Macbeth, mm -hmm. and, and uh, that was really very physical, but it, it was exploring the nature of obedience and kingship <clears throat> and vengeance and murder and 
Chaka and stuff. No, yes. but what shows almost, you know, the, the, the amazing universality of Shakespeare is that Macbeth, when you think about it, actually ought to be a Zulu play. Yes, it is. Right. You know, the original should have been in Zulu. <laughs> yes, yes, right. So yeah, Zulu, you're right. It? Yeah. It's very it's Zulu. Zulu. It's deeply yeah. Zulu. It is. It is. He tapped, but, Shakespeare tapped into the Zulu soul <laughs> yes. before the Zulus were, were cool. <laughs> and now John Carney comes to me and he says to me the other day, he said, I'm ready for the old man. Oh, really? Uh, he means King Lear. Uh, yes, of course. So I said, but there's a big problem. You can't inherit land as a Zulu woman. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Big voila. problem. Well, yeah. we'll have to sort that one out. <laughs> <laughs> and on that wonderful note, we'll have to say thank you to our panellists. Thank you so much.